All right, I'm ready. Yeah, so we start with your name and what you... Um, my name is Stacy Young, and uh, I got into Scientology in 1975, um, and I got out in 1989. So I was in for uh, almost 15 years. Um, what else do you want me to talk about? And what kind of work did you done for the organization, and uh, what kind of heroes have you have been working? How high or at which level? Okay. Uh, when I first got into Scientology, I um, wanted to become an auditor, uh, which is their form of counseling. And so I uh, joined the C organization, uh, which is their, uh, basically it's the unincorporated group of people that actually run Scientology. And uh, I went out to Los Angeles and joined the C organization there. And um, I did some training as an auditor, oh. uh, audited hundreds of hours, hundreds of people. Um, and then I became a supervisor of auditors, training people to audit. And uh, then I got into the guardian's office, which was the forerunner of the Office of Special Affairs. I got in um, about a year after the big raid in 1977, when the FBI raided the intelligence uh, departments of Scientology in Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. Um, that was what led to the criminal indictments of the leadership of Scientology in 1978, um, for which uh, 11 high-level Scientologists were uh, convicted of criminal wrongdoing. And what was your job within this uh, four of I was in public relations. Uh, uh, I was at that time in charge of personnel, in charge of um, getting new people into the guardian's office, uh, uh, making sure that people were doing their jobs correctly, um, taking care of them if they had personal problems, things like that. But not handling critics or journalists? Or no, not at that time. Not at that time. Um, then I was, uh, when, the, when the CMO, CMO? Mm -hmm. when the CMO took over the Guardian's office in 1981, um, my life changed fairly drastically. And I was uh, soon thereafter promoted to Author Services, Inc., where David Miscavige was uh, working and from it was from ASI that all of Scientology was being run at that time, when David Miscavige was in author services. <clears throat> I was promoted uh, to be his uh, organizing officer, is what it was called. That is the position from which, uh, in a Scientology organization, you take care of the personnel, you take care of um, uh, making sure that things are organized correctly and things like that. And how long did you work for this camp directly? Or uh, for uh, almost uh, six months. And uh, during that time, um, it was in 1982, and it was then that I began to realize that uh, the leadership of Scientology was totally corrupt. Um, the leadership of Scientology uh, didn't even believe in Scientology. Who especially? David Miscavige, Norman Starkey, uh, Lyman Spurlock, um, Marty Rathbun. Uh, I mean, how many people do you want me to name? Why did you the entire that? organization at the top of Scientology uh, is completely corrupt. Um, uh, it's, uh, they find it laughable that people lower down in Scientology believe all this stuff. And did they talk with you about that? They Did talked. They? Um, I was never, I, I was never really um, part of the very inner clique because I never uh, agreed with what they were doing. It always, uh, it, it really broke my heart mm -hmm. to find that what these people were doing who were leading Scientology were um, 
uh, basically ridiculing everything that I thought Scientology was supposed to be. And um, I ended up um, becoming so uh, disillusioned um, and so uh, exhausted and so uh, really close to the breaking point that I refused to go back to my job because uh, one night uh, we weren't sleeping very much. David Miscavige used to keep us from sleeping from Tuesday to Friday every week. Um, you couldn't sleep for three days in a row. And uh, I didn't do very well without any sleep. And, you know, we didn't eat very well. Uh, we never slept. We were under an enormous amount of stress all the time and really very close to the breaking point that means all the time. You work in the same office as Ms. Cabbage? Well, mine was next door to his. And where was this? It was uh, on Sunset Boulevard mm -hmm. in at Hollywood. At, at Author Services, Inc.? Author Services, Inc. The first building that Author Services had was on Sunset Boulevard mm -hmm. uh, on the ninth floor. And, how would you and David Miscavige screams so loudly with such profanity that you could be down on the sidewalk in Hollywood and you could hear him screaming on the sidewalk from the ninth floor of this office building. It was, it was a nightmare for me. It was a total nightmare. He screamed to you? He screamed to me. He screamed to everyone. For what he, reason? Because uh, he didn't like the way we were doing things. Uh, he, he had been... Um, he had been uh, uh, taught how to be an executive by L. Ron Hubbard, who also screamed at people, cursed people, used incredible profanity. Um, but Miscavige uh, cursed more than any person I've ever heard before. And finally one night, um, you, you know, I was, uh, I was refusing his orders. He was ordering me to... Um, do things to people that I thought was vicious, that I thought was not what Scientology was supposed to be all about. And I was refusing to do what he was telling me to do. Well, nobody refuses to do what David Miscavige tells them to do. But, but I felt that he was betraying the fundamental principles that I thought Scientology stood for. And so I found myself in a nightmare position. And he finally, one night, um, took me into his office, or my office, actually, and um, became absolutely furious with me. Um, I was very tired. I was very hungry. I was uh, in a very fragile state of mind anyway. And he screamed and cursed at me um, until I felt that I was about to lose my mind. So I had to get myself out of that situation, and I was sent to the Rehabilitation Project Force for that. To the RPF? Yeah. And what was your, your mistake you made? I refused to work for David Miscavige. Mm -hmm. And I called him a suppressive person <laughs> and a psychopath. During that conversation? And not to his face. I told this to, actually, I told it to Jesse. I told it to another person, um, and, and, he wrote it down and, and Miscavige it. found out about it, and I was sent to the RPF. And uh, who assigned you to the RPF? D DM. And how would you describe an RPF? Well, when I was uh, assigned to the RPF, I was up at the secret compound in Gilman Hot Springs, near Hemet, and it was 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, I was asleep in my room, and there was a knock on the door, and two guards uh, came into the room and ordered me to pack my clothes and escorted me to a van, which drove me down to the RPF and pack. And uh, I got there at about 6.30 in the morning. At that time, it was uh, in the basement of the big blue building, the complex, um, and I was uh, told to change my clothes. I was... Um, Did you get your prisoner uniform on then? Yeah. Black uniform? Yeah. And you get your uh, black 
or gray? No, you don't get that. You have to work up to having a gray armband. <laughs> you don't have anything um, when you first get into the RPF. The person has nothing, no, no band? No, no, no. The bands are, um, are symbols that you've begun to Rebellion. rehabilitate yourself. But, but, you start, but you start with nothing. The you start with nothing. You start with nothing, right. And then comes the first band. And then comes a white armband. Mm -hmm. And you get a white armband when you meet some requirements that, um, that show that you are starting to um, be an ethical person. Mm -hmm. And then you get a gold armband when you meet other requirements that show that you are starting to be responsible enough that you could actually be a member of a group again. And after that, after the gold armband, you are out? You're after the gold armband, then you get to graduate if they approve, if they decide that uh, you are um, um, rehabilitated enough to be amongst the regular people and you won't cause any more trouble. That means from one moment to the other you, you lost your job at Gilman Hot Springs where you worked? Oh. No, I lost my job uh, in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, uh, but why you have been at Gilman Hot Springs? Is because I was in trouble and I was sent up there to do the running program. The running program? You know, the, so the, uh, there was a big orange pole, pole and you run around the pole all day, yes. And which pole was it or where was it? Exactly? It was um, out of Gilman Hot Springs. At Gilman Hot Springs? Yeah, there near were the two poles. Course, near the golf course? Uh, there was no golf course at that time. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was near okay. where the golf course is now. Yeah. But, near the film studio, the film but studio at that time, yeah. At that time, um, it was just. It's across the road. Yeah, it was across the road. Is living on, on the other side. No, no, no. It was across from there. It was on the other side. On the other side. Yeah. The road is on the other side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and do you know who David Mayo is? Okay. Mm -hmm. David Mayo was in so much trouble that they set up a separate pole for him that he could, <laughs> he could run around this pole all by himself. And then everybody else was running around this other pole because nobody could talk to David Miscavige. I mean, to David Mayo. That means you, you had to run for hours or what? Twelve hours a day. Around that pole? Yeah. And Until you realized that you had been uh, faulty in your thinking and, and uh, were ready to think straight again and be a proper Scientologist. And for how many days went this on? Well, I was uh, forced to continue the running program after I got into the RPF. Um, and we did it in Los Angeles, um, in Griffith Park, mm -hmm. uh, in the parking lot of um, the Greek Amphitheater, which is a big, um, you know, it's a big uh, auditorium. I mean, you know, it's an outs it's a, a a open air auditorium yeah. where they have music and things like that. So you run well, around on the we ran lot? we ran around the parking lot of the, <laughs> the Greek I'm Amphitheater. Really with about, there were about 25 people in the RPF who were on the running program, as well as some executives from ASI and some other people that had been assigned by DM to the running program. And they run around for days? For days. For days. 12 yeah. hours a day. And when starts the real work, like, uh, like renovating things like, uh, like the regular? On my uh, RPF? Yeah. Um, my RPF was a bit of a more extreme situation than most because I had been working directly for DM. Uh, DM uh, was convinced that I was um, uh, an agent for the government, um, that I had Which been government? The US government. for the United States government, um, or perhaps an agent for uh, an attorney who at that time was um, causing lots of trouble for Scientology named Michael Flynn. Um, and DM had me interrogated uh, for weeks. He personally? No, he had me interrogated. Mm -hmm. He had two um, very large former Marines mm -hmm. lock me in a room, uh, and one of them walked back and forth in front of me, screaming at me, accusing me of um, all kinds of things and demanding to that I confess to who I was working for, um, what kinds of things I had stolen from ASI, um, all kinds of extreme paranoia. And this was in the blue complex? This was in the basement of the blue complex. In the basement. Yeah. Um, and so one of them, uh, Rick Asneran, walked back and forth screaming at me while another person, Andre Tabayoyan, um, sat at the e-meter and watched the meter to see what, what I was thinking. Um, and then, so I would go on the running program, 
first I would be interrogated in the morning, and then I would go, uh, I would be sent up to the running program in the afternoon and until the end of the night. And um, so one day I hurt my back very badly running on the running program, and I was um, ordered by the doctor to, you know, not move. And so um, uh, DM wanted me transferred to Florida, here, to Clearwater, uh, to get me away from my husband um, at the time because he decided that I would be a bad influence on my husband because I was a, you know, I was being critical of him, I was being, you know, disaffected, um, and he didn't want my influence to rub off on my husband who was an ASI staff member. And so I was ordered to Clearwater, um, but the doctor said that it would be dangerous for me to be moved because of my back injury, and so I was incarcerated on the seventh floor of the complex um, for nearly five months, That's not cool. allowed to leave the seventh floor uh, under guard, 24 hours a day. Um, How and many people have slept in your room or in the night? Uh, in your room or about nine. Nine, nine. About nine. There were bunks. It was nine it was a room filled with bunks, you know, three tiers high, um, and I had a bed of my own because of my back injury, so I was having to do work, uh, you know, administrative work for the RPF because of my back. Um, but you know, I would also I was also um, lying on the floor, uh, cleaning the shower on my back, you know, doing, you know, cleaning just on my back because I couldn't move. So I was still um, being forced to do manual labor, but it was a little unusual. Mm -hmm. So you had, uh, you had been there imprisoned for yeah. more than five months with yeah. blue complex. Mm -hmm. And um, how was your um, condition after the five months? Are you getting worse? Uh, my mental condition or my your physical condition? condition? And mental. Well, you know, my mental condition was such that I now was acutely aware of the fact that I was in an organization that would uh, stop at nothing to shut me up if I continued to speak out the way I was, the way I had done, which caused me to go to the RPF. I mean, I, my experience with David Miscavige is what shattered my uh, illusion about Scientology. and. I knew from that point forward that um, I had to be careful of what I said, I had to be careful of what I did. Um, I, I was ready to leave at that time, but my husband um, wasn't ready to leave yet, and I wasn't willing to leave him in there because I was afraid I would never see him again. So my state of mind on the RPF was uh, one of extreme fear. Um, they were, they didn't allow me to communicate with my husband at all while I was on the RPF. I didn't know what had happened to him. He didn't know what had happened to me. Um, I was very frightened. Um, I was very much uh, concerned to make the leadership, particularly Miscavige, uh, believe that I was now ready again to toe the line, you know, ready again to, to be a good Scientologist and to be quiet. And you had any chance to, to flee the scene that you can go out of that? Uh, floor? If I, uh, no, I was not know. able. Oh no, I couldn't leave so the seventh floor while I was while I was incarcerated. No, but you know, I graduated the RPF. I was um, able to convince Miscavige, who had a, personally approved my getting out of the RPF. I was able to convince him that I was um, no longer a threat for Scientology. For Scientology. And he allowed me out of the prison, um, and then I uh, was basically um, watched mm -hmm. for several months to oh, make sure that I was really okay. You went to back to your job. You already. Had I went back to a job. I went to no, no. I went to same. no. I didn't. I was um, put in sort of a low-level supervisory job so that they could kind of watch me and see how I did. In L.A.? In L.A., yeah. So you never w worked again at, at Gilman, for example? Or I, I didn't work there. I was, I was there quite often. 
Um, but I was never posted there. I was posted in L.A. because I was in OSA. I went back into OSA after that, and I went into public relations at that point mm -hmm. and um, became the editor of Freedom Magazine and, because I'm a writer. And so they posted me as a writer at that point. Um, I think that uh, Miscavige no longer wanted me in charge of any personnel because mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think he trusted me that way. And how would you describe an RPA? Uh, it's a political prison. That's what it is. People are sent to the RPF who are dissident, um, disaffected, uh, critical in any way. That's where they're sent. And they stay there until they stop being critical and dissident uh, and are willing to behave themselves. And they don't get off the RPF until they're willing to behave themselves, and that's the bottom line. <laughs> and it means you have been there only five months, so it's a very long time. No, I was there for longer than that, but I was incarcerated on the seventh floor for five months. I was on the RPF for, uh, I think, more like nine months. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And when was that? In which year? In 1982 and into 83. Mm -hmm. And when you left, finally, by authority, the organization? Mm -hmm. When did you left? Um, I, my husband and I finally left together in 1989, in July. Um, Basically, from 1982 until 1989, I was waiting for him to realize to that it was time to go. He tried to escape. He was on the RPF up in Happy Valley, Happy Valley um, in 1987 and 88. And he did try to escape across the Indian reservation <laughs> through the fields. And um, he, uh, he, what he was hoping to do was to get a hold of me um, in LA before Scientology discovered that he had escaped. And so um, he, uh, but it took him longer than he had thought it was going to take him to get to a phone because he went to uh, the phone of some Indians that lived on the reservation and asked them if he could call me. And um, by the time he called me, I was surrounded by guards in my office in LA the same time. because they had found out that he had escaped. Right and they knew that he would be trying to call me. So I was supposed to help these security guards get him back. Well, of course, I, I didn't want to help them get him back. I wanted to get out with them, but I couldn't tell them that because then they'd hold me under guard and then we'd never get a chance to see each other. So, um, so I, uh, he called and these people are all standing around me saying, you know, find out where he is so we can go get him, find out where he is so we can go get him. And he said, do they know? And I said, yes. And he said, OK, then uh, they want to know where I am. And I said, yes. And because um, nobody else was listening on the phone, <laughs> fortunately. And um, he said, OK, then I'm going to have to hang up. I'm going to have to you know, contact you later. And he hung up the phone. And they said, you know, well, so did he tell you where he is? Did he tell you where he is? And I said, no, I couldn't. You know, he hung up before I could find out. So, <laughs> um, but then um, he, t he called a cab. A, a taxi to the Indian reservation. at the Indian reservation and he was going to to take him into Hemet to a hotel mm -hmm. so that he could hole up there until he could get a hold of me and um, the security guards out at Hemet followed the cab and so he got out of the taxi at the motel in Hemet and they surrounded him mm -hmm. and um, so he said y you know you have to let me go into the motel I want to talk to my wife and um, and if you don't you know, I won't come with you unless you let me talk to Stacy. I want Stacy to be brought out here. And so this went on for all night long. You know, they were arguing with him and trying to talk him out of this and, you know, trying to get him to come back with them. And he was refusing. Back, coming back to Happy Valley. Yeah. Um, and he was refusing. And, um, and so finally, in the middle of the night, they came and got me out of bed and said, you've got to go up to Hammett because Vaughn is refusing to cooperate unless he gets to see you. <laughs> yeah. you so you somebody drove, drove me up to to uh, to Hemet or to Gilman Hot Springs and I was taken into the ethics office there and this the woman the yeah in which building? Yeah. in Qual. I don't know if you well it wasn't Qual. it was the WDC building mm -hmm. the watchdog committee mm -hmm. building actually Where these, uh, it's it's um you know, if the guard, if you, the guard booth is over here, mm -hmm. and the ship is over there, it was over there. Mm -hmm. It was one of the buildings over there. And um, this woman, uh, Janadier, mm -hmm. 
Swanson, who was one of DM's um, sort of head people, mm -hmm. sat me down and said, um, you know, Vaughn wants to talk to you, and I just want to make sure that you're um, that your ethics are in and you're okay and you know you are with us and trying to get him back and all this stuff and I said oh yeah 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 I'm totally with you I'm totally with you <laughs> because I thought we'd never see these people again you know I thought finally when Vaughn and I got together out at Hemet um, we would go mm -hmm. but instead um, they took me to see him in the hotel and um, and we were just gonna uh, call the police and t get them to escort us out of town and get these people to leave us alone. But, but the problem was we weren't really ready to be out of Scientology. We wanted to be out of the Sea Org, but we wanted to be public Scientologists, you know, and have a little White House with a little picket fence and a dog and have a nice life and continue to be able to go up the bridge to total freedom. You know, I mean, we were still of the mindset, and so we decided that we would go back and route out, which is, you know, you have to get sec checked and mm -hmm. you have to go through this whole procedure to look, to, so they will let you go. And we went back, uh, so we went back. And they put us up in this beautiful apartment suite and just were treating us like royalty at because, gold. at gold, mm -hmm. because, um, near the ship on the say what? Near the ship on, on the, the other side. side. On the other side. At that time, it's different now than it was mm -hmm. then. This was in 1987, mm -hmm. 88. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't, a lot of the things weren't built yet then. Mm -hmm. But um, so they put us up in this beautiful VIP suite. And um, because they were so worried about Vaughn, because he was a very high level executive. And, uh, and he and I both had information that they didn't want us to leave with. So they were treating us very, very nicely and all this kind of stuff. And um, the next day, DM and Norman um, called Vaughn up to the ship and talked him back in. Mm. Uh, basically told him that it had all been a big mistake um, and that, you know, everything was going to be okay now. They were going to get everything corrected that he was upset about and it, everything would be fine. Well, you know. To make a long story short, they ended up talking him into going back to the RPF. He went back to the prison camp. Yes. I mean, these people have, have a control over your mind, which is very difficult to explain. It's very difficult to explain. Um, mind control? Pure mind control? Well, but that, what does that mean? I mean, that doesn't really mean anything when you say that. It's, it's, um, You know, you really honestly believe when you're a Scientologist that it is the only route to happiness. And that if you leave it, you have no hope of ever being happy. I mean, you honestly believe that when you're in there. And, and I don't know how they're able to accomplish that belief. All I can do is describe it. Um, you know, Vaughn agreed to go back to the RPF because he truly believed that it was very important for him to continue to be a Scientologist. It, this was the only way that they would allow him to continue to be a Scientologist. And so, you know, people submit to the most degrading, uh, abusive, terrifying experiences that you can imagine for the sake of this uh, elusive and delusional idea.